Welcome to Syntax. We've got a stumped episode for you today. This is where Scott and I will make uh, make ourselves embarrassed as of what we don't know about JavaScript, HTML, CSS, all that stuff. We ask each other interview style questions and the in an attempt to stump the other one. Um, and the benefit to you is that you get to learn a thing or two along the way. And it's uh, always a really fun time. We do this once every couple months. So uh, my name is Wes Boss. I'm a developer from Canada. With me, as always, is Scott Tolinsky. How you doing, Scott? Doing really good, man. Doing really good. I've been producing a lot of demos, building a lot of fun stuff, getting into a lot of like really local data, data syncing. It's funny. I have all these existing apps. Like I have my breakdancing app that I use. Yeah. Uh, I converted that to local first with like a naive sync strategy where it Ooh. syncs to pocket base or always overrides what's coming one way or another. So like really naive sync, no CRDTs, but local storage app runs entirely offline. And then I, I converted my habit app to using REPL cache to do like actual CRDT syncing and versioning and stuff. Man, it's like a whole new world of client side apps that run very fast. Beautiful. If you get stumped yourself, <laughs> on any of your code. Chances well, are it's good to throw an error. So wow. you're going to head on to sentry.io forward slash syntax. And guess what? Sentry has a bunch of stuff to help you when you're stumped. You maybe even you're stumped on a bug. You got a bug, you don't know how to fix it. You know, the best part about Sentry is you can see how many people it's affecting, what the stack trace looks like. There's even a fun little uh, potential AI fix where you can spin the wheel and see if AI can look at your stack trace and provide you with the solution. There's so many interesting, useful aspects of of anything. So if you're you're stumped on your performance issues, Sentry's got you. You're, you're stumped on slow queries, Sentry's got you. You're stumped on anything, uh, Sentry's got you. And uh, head on over to sentry.io forward slash syntax time and make it two months for free. All right. All right. I am ready to embarrass myself here. Are you? you want to do rock, paper, scissors for who goes first? I would love winner. That. Winner goes first. Ready? Rock, paper, scissors, shoot, though, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We always. Okay. Hopefully there's Just no make, lag this time. Are you ready? Yeah. Yep. Rock, rock, paper, paper, scissors, paper, scissors. So, shoot. We both scissors. One All more right, time. Let's do it again. Ready? Rock, rock, paper, paper scissors, scissors, throw, shoot. <laughs> Both paper. <laughs> scissors. All right, ready? Yes. Rock, Rock paper, paper, scissors, 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 throw. Shoot. No. We both oh, three for three. How All is right, this here possible? we go again. Oh, okay. Rock, paper, well, no, 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 scissors. Wait, wait, wait. I wasn't, I wasn't ready yet. Okay. Ready? Okay. Go. Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Scissors. Yeah, we did the same. Okay, we're four. <sighs> Four ties so far. How is this possible? Which is statistically not impossible, but high. Again. Unlikely. Last one. Rock, Rock paper, paper, scissors, scissors. Throw. Shoot. Oh! All right. You cut my paper. Give me a question. <laughs> okay. Okay. First question. Oh, okay. This one's... Mm -mm. This one's maybe beginner to medium difficulty. In React, what's the difference between use memo and use callback? And in what scenarios would you use one or the other? Oh, man. Um, that's a good. Yeah, I know. These are my two of my least favorite APIs, the fact I yeah. need them and all. Quite honestly, I don't worry about them. I don't use them all that often. So <laughs> I'm going to say... Same. Uh, use callback is memoizes the function definition, whereas use memo. Uh, man, I have a I have a whole thing I wrote on this as well, and <laughs> I'm totally blanking. Use callback will allow you to memoize the function definition, which is helpful because on re render the function if you put if you define a function inside of a component that function will be redefined every single time use memo i think is like that but it will also it will just memoize the output of something some some data or output of a component is that right so the difference yes. is being function definition versus output yeah value so uh, use memo memoizes the result and use Results, callback yes. memoizes the function definition and like you said this is because 
in React, React components are functions. You call a function and you have a function being defined inside of that function. Every single time that function is called, that inside function will be redefined. Um, yeah, exactly. that's part of okay. part of the downside of having a function component, right? And so two two things there. First of all, I don't haven't run into many performance issues where that has really mattered, at least in my yeah, opinion or in my yeah. stuff. A lot of people have. Second of all, that's what the React, React compiler is going to do. So you don't have to use use callback and use memo, which is going to be kind of nice. Just do it for yeah. me. Yeah, for sure. And the reason why you don't have to do that, and let me just throw some Svelte. The reason why you don't yeah. have to do that in Svelte is because in Svelte, when your component re-renders, it doesn't rerun the JavaScript in your component. It's updating individual values. It knows exactly effects. where yeah. to update the little bits. That's the, the beauty of a compiled language. Yeah. My next question for you is explain the concept of tree shaking in modern JavaScript bundlers. How does it work and what are the benefits? I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to laugh because I typed in question two on my end and it says, explain the concept of tree shaking. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're, so we're using Claude AI here and obviously it's deterministic to a point oh, where so we use the same prompts uh, and we're getting the same question. So I'll, uh, I'll shake, shake up my prompt a little so we get some different ones, but that's so funny. Yes. I can still, answer I this. I'm not going to try to answer is. this. Yeah. yeah. Um, my understanding of tree shaking is that let's say you have a package that you've installed. That package has 10 files in it. And you might have a very specific import path to access specific either uh, modules or functions or whatever from that. And my yeah. understanding is that tree shaking takes all those other modules that could be loaded from that package. And if you're not using them, it removes them from your bundle, AKA like the stuff in your tree that you're using stays there and you shake it out and all the stuff that isn't being used is removed. Yeah. Nailed it. I, I, cool. I often think about that where like, if you're shaking a tree, don't you want the stuff that falls? Um, uh, but depends, but yeah. the code is the other way, right? Like you're shaking out the stuff that you don't use and you're keeping the stuff that you do use. What if you had a Cut. bunch of junk in the tree and you just want to shake out that junk? <laughs> that's yeah, that's I true. Think. Bunch of oh, you know what? We whenever you do we, that, we yeah. um we have got our hyd hyd hydrangeas are blooming like crazy right now. Same, yeah, and, ours are uh, massive. Yeah, so I brought a bunch in and I, I cut them and put them in a, a vase, and then all the kids were sitting around the table, and I was like, "Look!" and I shook them. Earwigs everywhere, like probably fifty earwigs in the hydrangeas. Yeah, yeah, they were all in the like the blooms. So our hydrangeas gross. are like filled with bees right now, and I'm loving it. I'm loving that oh. bee. Yeah, let's get that sweet, sweet honey. I know, right? No kidding. Actually, I just planted. We have we have massive hydrangeas here, Wes. We have several of yep. them, and I just planted two more in that tree that I pulled out. I uprooted a tree like a weed. I'm about to do another one, and I'm gonna just fill Screw that trees, space, man. With yeah, well, they're yeah. dead. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> fill it with hydrangeas here. So it's good. All about I, that. Uh, I went on like a hydrangea kick where I propagated. Yeah, like I saw that. Several yeah. hundred and a lot of them died. But now I have, I probably have like 30 hydrangeas at the cottage that I'm working on. It's but the, the best, damn deer, the, the damn deer keep eating them. So they're not growing as fast as I would hoped. Okay. Side note here, our garden, guess what keeps eating everything in our garden? My mop dog. My my dog, <laughs> who looks like a mop, she ate our broccoli. She ate the entirety of the broccoli. She uprooted and ate it. She ate all of the beets that we planted. She uprooted and ate them. Now she's eating healthy, lettuce. Healthy ass dog, yeah. She ate some tomatoes out of there. I'm like, please, just stay out of the garden. <laughs> like, <laughs> okay, it's like a sorry. rabbit. I know, it's ridiculous. All right, next question. In the context of CSS grid, explain the difference between grid template areas and grid area. How can they be used together to be create complex layouts? And what are some potential pitfalls when using them? Uh, well, grid template area is where instead of defining the rows and columns of a grid, you sort of you name them, right? In so which one? You, grid template area. Areas. Grid template areas. Grid template areas. Yes. Okay, cool. Is that is that right so far? Where you're like yes. you could do like sidebar, 
sidebar content content sidebar content like you're essentially like visually mapping it on out and then grid area is how you take a grid item and put it in one of those predefined named areas that's absolutely correct Woo! what are what are some common pitfalls do you suspect (laughs) oh what are some potential to watch out for when using them yeah it's kind of an odd question Uh, um I, I don't know. Like, like I guess, like when you when you go to a breakpoint, you have to redefine the grid template area. Yeah, and that could be handy. Is that true? Here, let me give you one for my personal collection. I don't know what they what they're expecting as the answer, but like, let's say you define your grid template areas, then you attach like maybe helper utility classes to those grid template areas, and then you modify them slightly. <laughs> you modify the grid template areas slightly, and the whole thing stops working, or worse, it <laughs> it, it doesn't just break in a graceful way. It like just oh, yeah. it like behaves kind of oddly, and then you're like, what is what could possibly be going on here? Oh, wait, I changed this one. Okay. Yeah, that, I think that, that, what do they say? They say incomplete grid definition, discontinuous areas. A grid area must be rectangular. You can't create an L-shaped grid area. Overuse leading to complex, hard to maintain layoffs. That's kind of what I was getting at before. But yeah, I, I think grid template areas are really neat. I personally usually define those named sections of my grid using grid template columns and yeah define the names within the column definition but you know there's a lot of really advanced use cases you can do with uh, grid template areas all right i'm going to give you a question i got a couple questions here i'm 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 curious do you want like a when do you want one that's like i know what that is but when would i ever need that sure or yeah Yeah. okay whatever give me whatever you got i don't care okay i got I'm down for it. Uh, what is the temporal dead zone in JavaScript and how does it relate to variables declared with let and const? Bro, I'm going to be honest. I have never heard of the temporal dead zone. So I'm no? going to take a big old fat fail on this one. Yeah. I used to be the, one of the first things that would pop up when you Googled it. No, I'm not even on the first page anymore. This it, So this was rolled out in ES6. The temporal dead zone is a period between uh, entering a scope and the declaration of the variable. So mm. with the var variables, as soon as you enter into a scope, like inside of a function, a variable that is declared later on in the scope can be referenced before it's even declared which is wild in its own. Like, why would you ever want that? It would just be undefined. Whereas in with let and const variables, you cannot reference a variable until it's been declared. In that area, when you enter into a scope where a variable is, but before it has been declared, is called the temporal dead zone. Duh. Yeah. Okay. But again, who's who's making variables? Who's referencing variables before they're they're declared? Right. Yeah. That's odd. It's got a cool name, at least. Yeah. Sick. I called it the temporal dad zone on one of my videos, and I get an email probably once a month saying I spelled it wrong. Oh, but that's nobody great. gets the joke. <laughs> oh, that's very fun. Okay, this was fun. Um, describe the inner workings of the JavaScript event loop, including the oh roles of the call stack, callback queue, and micro task queue. Uh, there's more to this where it's asking you to explain promises and async and how that fits into here but let's just keep it at that first bit describe the inner workings of the javascript event loop the roles of the call stack callback queue and micro task queue man i feel like i've answered this once on a stumped before and i always reference the that like it's like a 12 year old video on on how the event loop works Mm -hmm. so the event loop is when the JavaScript engine is running through the the JavaScript um, and you hit like an API, like to run a function, Uh, what it does is it takes that function to run and it throws it on top of the call stack. And then the call stack is a list of things to actually run. Um, And then when it is running them, it puts them into the queue. This is a bad example. We did a whole show on the event, the JavaScript event loop. What, yeah. What number is it? 
Uh, syntax episode 384 we also asked wow. this question i probably biffed it then as well I it was I how similar of a question a was explanation it? of it i yeah. think exactly this this question that's wild uh that's yeah. wild that we could get you. okay well okay here here's here's at least the answer it's looking for call stack uh this is the uh where the functions uh, function calls are stacked and executed. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it follows a last in first out structure. So you put something on the top, it's on the top, you know, last in first out. Uh, when a function is called, it's pushed onto the stack. When it returns, it's popped off. Callback queue, the queue holds callback functions from asynchronous operations like set timeout, DOM events, and HTTP requests. So callback queue is for those types of things. So that when when it, when you have like a like a, a set timeout, it needs to run after a certain amount of time. That's put into the callback queue. The microtask queue is a queue that has a higher priority than the callback queue. It holds micro tasks, which are usually created by promises or the mutation observer. So this is things with a higher priority, like the callback queue. And the event loop itself continuously checks the call stack. And then if it's empty, it checks the micro task uh, and executes all micro tasks. After the micro task queue is empty, it checks the first task from the callback queue and pushes it to the call stack. So, hey, the call stack is something that, you know, you got to get into if you're getting really deep into your your performance and understanding yeah. that. but for most us ui developers you know you don't really have to think about it very often yeah the the call stack is something i'm very familiar with from a debugging point of view yeah and i have hit issues in the past where you put like a in a wait one second or you put a set timeout in there mm -hmm. and that will push everything to the end of the the call stack because I've, I've had issues with that in the past but not enough to just confidently uh, rattle off how that works. I was asked to, I was asked that question in an interview once, and Ooh. I definitely did not uh, execute that question correctly. <laughs> uh, All right, I got one for you here. What is the shadow DOM in web components, and how does it differ from the regular DOM? Explain how encapsulation is achieved using the shadow DOM and discuss potential use cases. Yeah. Okay. Shadow DOM is used for scoping of your web components, or uh, I don't know if it's used outside of web components. I think you can maybe, I don't know. Either way, it's primarily used for scoping within your web components. Uh, sometimes you have a component, let's think like, um, like you can imagine a component that you have in the, in the web, like a, like an audio player that looks like a play yep. button and a whatever that's made up of smaller individual elements. And you can have some default styles for that thing that really uh, choose how that looks. So you can write classes or even access uh, styles on those things by element selectors and stuff without having that CSS that you've written it get exposed to your full on application. So I could potentially inside of a shadow Dom say div is the color of red, and it's only gonna affect the things inside of the shadow DOM and nothing outside of it. It also can make styling in from outside to inside more difficult as well, which is why you often see a web component type of situations where they're not setting values on DOM elements themselves to control the styling, but they're being done through CSS variables that can then get leaked into the shadow dom and update the, the properties yeah, exposed there. yeah beautiful i like it that was that was very well done and the uh syntax player is the shadow uses uh web components and shadow dom right on syntax yeah it uses media chrome from the mux team which if you're doing any video player or audio player media chrome i highly recommend as a web component to take care of that instead of using any sort of bespoke player library because let me tell you all of the player libraries are garbage and media chrome is where it's at uh, i've used <laughs> you, you line them up i've probably used 10 different react based video players all the ones that claim to do all this stuff i've used player.js used uh, used them all uh medium chrome is where it's at um, that was actually a phase of mine when i was working on the syntax or the um level up tutorial site was constantly swapping out my video player because all of them have limitations in some regard or suck in some sort of way <laughs> so all right next question here um oh this one's too easy too sorry it's like explain ssr which you know nah, yeah i could do that it's in the name 
Uh, I feel ridiculous constantly typing harder to chat GPT here or Claude <laughs> to say harder <laughs> and each time it gives me a new one. Uh, okay. Oh, this is a fun one. Also going to be hard. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have asked for too much harder here, uh, but this is kind of in line with the last one, but maybe a little bit more generic or maybe a little bit less focused on JavaScript. Can you explain the process of the critical rendering path optimization in modern web browsers. I'll just give you one of these because a lot of them are like, can you tell how it's different in Blink and Gecko? I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about this. This one is detail the six major steps of the critical rendering path, DOM construction, CSS, OM construction, rendering tree construction, layout paint, and compositing. Critical rendering path. Okay. Um, Detail the six major steps: DOM construction, CSS, OM construction, render tree construction. Layout. Okay, I can I get this. Yeah, All right, so I think you might be able your, to. Your browser goes and downloads uh, some HTML, right? And the HTML will then be parsed out and rendered into DOM elements. And part of that parsing of the HTML may be to also intentionally or, uh, go and grab some other resources such as CSS or JavaScript or images, things that are are put in there. Then the next one is, are, are these in order? They are. CSS object model construction. Okay. Um, the that should give CSS you a hint. object model is once the CSS is, I, I don't know, I'm actually guessing, I'm guessing on this one, but I'm assuming it's when the CSS is being parsed and it applies those styles to the DOM, which means that it is now available both for the browser to paint it, which is a, a, a later step, as well as with JavaScript to be able to access its values. Yeah, so the it, I think it's close. I don't know how much it's actually applying anything. The browser converts CSS rules into a tree-like structure, so just like the, the DOM construction. Um, yeah. And then... It is render blocking, by the way. This The browser won't render any processed content until the CSS object model is complete. I think the next part, well, well, we'll talk about the next part and then layout paint. I don't think anything yet has been done other than parsing into a tree-like structure. Oh, uh, okay. So yeah. DOM construction is it's parsing. CSS, it creates all of the the stack of, of um, CSS rules to then apply. Yep. The render tree construction, render tree construction, I'm, I'm assuming turning the HTML into DOM elements. I thought that was the DOM construction, though. That is the DOM. Maybe. This combines the DOM and the CSS into one render tree. It includes only the nodes necessary for rendering the page, omits things like head script and elements being hidden by CSS display none. So you know the process. You have your DOM elements. You have your CSS. Yeah. This is yeah. the process now where it's like, Okay, this thing has a, a a CSS display none, so let's remove that element from this. Oh, um, okay. And then it also applies style rules to each visible node. So this is where the like the combination of HTML and CSS occurs. Oh, okay, okay, all right. And then to be clear, have... I don't know these answers before looking them up. So I'm okay. Uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, this is this is actually really interesting. Then we it have is. layout. So layout is where the browser will figure out where on the page things will go so it says all right well this thing is 50 pixels high 80 pixels uh, to the left it is um it is orange background right it'll figure out where it needs to be on the page which then gives it to the next one which is actually taking that layout and painting it deciding which part of that layout needs to be put onto the screen and uh, if it's been updated which parts of the screen need to be repainted the only the only uh, caveat I have there is layout is is just is position is just doing position it's just position and then oh, paint really? gets okay. into colors yeah oh so it only where it goes and then the oh that's actually I didn't even know that that was a thing can you turn off paint and just do layout I'm curious what that looks like at that point you know probably yeah. a, a website without any styles on it. Yeah. Um, interesting. But like, how how does it do layout if like this, the contents of 
like it's like font size part of layout or font size part of paint i don't know this says determines where and how elements are positioned relative to each other so that to me says it's all a relative based and not like an ex well calculates the exact position yeah paint fills in visual elements draws text so therefore that's when paint happens when it draws text right okay. um yeah interesting and the last one compositing is, is kind of let's see over uh handles overlapping elements and transparency uh does stuff where the gpu is used um, allows for smooth transitions draws the painted layers onto the screen in the correct order so those steps combined bingo bingo you got a website ah and so where you'll hear this word critical rendering path thrown around a lot is uh uh, people only care about performance stuff if it's in the way of the critical rendering path, mm -hmm. because all of these steps are the steps that need to happen before you, the user, see something on the page, right? And th that's critical. <laughs> yeah. So uh, if another aspect of your, your code base does not get in the way of this, maybe it's not as important as the stuff that is slowing down this critical rendering path. Word. All right. What do we got next here? Describe the purpose and functionality of the intl.segmenter API in JavaScript. Provide an example of when this API will be particularly useful. Segmenter. Yeah. I Man. Ooh. I have I've a video on some, this and I'm just searching yeah. for it. I, yeah, I'm going to take a wild guess because I've never used Segmenter, but I have used some things here. And I do know uh, some of your social media videos. So you saying that you have a video on it uh, did help me. That is a bit of oh. a hint. I'm guessing, and this is a wild guess, I'm guessing it's used for um, a Segmenter. Let's say you have a list of things and you want to add on the correct ending to them that is how you would do it. I don't know how you do it. I've never used Intel. I'm, I'm just guessing here because I know you did a video on that. <laughs> yeah, you are referring to intl.pluralrules, uh, oh, okay. which is That's for right. something yeah. called ordinals, which is okay. first, second, third in all of the different languages because those are different in, in every language. But what we're referring to here is intl.segmenter. And this is an API that will allow you to segment text based on different locale locales and probably the easiest way to understand this is some emojis are multiple characters but they are one perceived character or one perceived word so mm -hmm. if you've ever done a dot split on an emoji you'll know that sometimes it splits into six or seven characters like the um the family with the uh, two dads and two kids and they they have you're able to decide their skin tone and how many uh, what the parents are and what the two kids are um and there's actually a really interesting story with those is that it's kind of gone off the rails where everybody <laughs> wants an infinite combination you know yes. like yes. six moms and 14 children all of I'll, different skin tones i want the so, sweating clown emoji because that's my favorite yeah. one <laughs> <laughs> we use that on, on the Discord for like whenever you made him like if I made a mistake and I want to refer yeah. to myself as a clown, I'll have the, the sweating clown but like oops. Sweating yeah. clown that is also Santa, you know? Like so oh, yeah, it actually sure. turns out that a lot of like Facebook, Apple, they're all just rolling out just outlines of families now because it's it's um it's getting hard to keep up with all the different permutations. I can only imagine the designer that has to make every single combination of those. Anyways, that's not what I'm we're talking about here. INTL segmenter will split text into perceived words or perceived sentences um, mm. because different languages are not just using spaces and different languages also use characters that are more than one bit. Uh, so dot split is not some, not a uh, a use case there. Hmm. Yeah, I have not I've not used that. That's a that's an odd one. But if you ever need to split up a some text into words, like like for example, if you're trying to make like a, a karaoke where you're just flashing one mm. word at a time, don't mm. use dot split with a space. Use segmenter really? because there's possibility that there's an emoji in there. 
That's interesting. Yeah, I, I, I would never consider that. That's a neat one. Uh, let me get you another question here. I'm not going to go as brutal this time. Okay. So I'll tell uh, Claude to go softer here, and we'll get like, <laughs> let's see. Okay, yeah, this is fun. Explain the concept of WASM or WebAssembly in the role of modern web development. WebAssembly allows you to take and run languages in the browser or with with WASI, you can run them literally anywhere that a JavaScript is run. But for example, if you have a program like FFmpeg that's written in, in C, or if you have a, another, another program that's written in like PHP and you need to almost containerize that application or compile it down into like assembly code it's mm. not assembly code but like that's the the whole idea and and bring that and then interface with it from javascript web assembly will allow you to to do that so once something has been compiled like ffmpeg is what we use on the syntax website i want to run that in a javascript environment i don't have to worry about linux permissions or having c running or mm. having to compile it for my environment it just runs in wasi and it will run on on my iPhone, it will run on my Linux serverless just fine. Yeah. Can you uh, talk on any potential security impl- uh, considerations for using WebAssembly? <laughs> just, you don't have um, to. This is just a little follow up. Potential security implications. Maybe a security issue could be that essentially because you're running it in the browser, it is not able to. Like you're running something that is normally done on the server, right? Mm-hmm. You're running it in the browser. So that could be an issue. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, let's see. What do you think? Code obfuscation. So maybe something's running that you don't know is running uh, third party code from WASM modules. Again, if you didn't compile oh, it because yourself. It's compiled. Yeah. Yeah. You might not know exactly what's you in there. You don't maybe know what's running because it's some crazy away. stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think yeah. that's that's pretty much the big one. Yeah. All right. Here's a Svelte question. Ooh. Explain the concept of Svelte stores, particularly focusing on the difference between writable, readable, and derived stores. How mm. do Svelte stores compare to state management solutions in other frameworks like React? Yeah, I'll do I'll do you one one better in that like I'll I'll even compare it to the new Rune system. So Svelte writables is basically uh, like a reactive state variable, and what's interesting about them is that you can subscribe to them, you can observe them, right? So with a writable, you can create a writable that allows you to mutate that value. You can subscribe and watch for changes of that value, and you can when you read you can read it you can write it you can output it and um defining it when you use it in a template is just with a dollar sign so writable is basically a reactive data store that you can write a readable uh readable is a readable data store you cannot write to it you cannot mutate this thing you can just it's like a uh, something that is um created for the purpose of only being read from uh top down right and then you and have readable. a derived which is something that is being derived from a already existing value. So um, this might come into play when let's say, let's say you have, let's say you have like a, a shopping cart and maybe you're storing that entire shopping cart in a writable, you can create a derived store that is maybe potentially just the total that's calculating the values of all of the items inside of the shopping cart. That's a good example. And these things are, they're they're usable in Svelte 5 still. They're not going away. But in Svelte 5, the way of doing this stuff is with the new runes syntax because uh, what it does is it allows you to it allows you to have more control over your state. And therefore they function in a way that is less a little less magical than writables, but n- not necessarily more complex. So the way that uh, the new state works inside of Svelte is that there, it creates a proxy. So it creates a proxy of the thing and you're using that proxy. Whenever that value is read, it actually outputs the real value. But if let's say you were to console log the state, it would show the state as a proxy for what the actual state is. Uh, this gives you more control. You can create whole classes full of state and stuff like that. You can write your own subscribe stuff. You have to use getters and setters. Either way, Svelte state 
largely allows you to keep your state outside of the component tree and then just access it. And since Svelte is watching for values rather than for re-renders, it knows when that value is changed. It's observing that value for a change and then updating it in your template, just that singular value. Beautiful. That was very, very well put. Good job. Yeah, I was getting a little rambly there. Uh, no, it's hey. good. I think it's it's interesting because like that doesn't just apply to Svelte either, but the concept of a writable store and a derived store is uh, is pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah. In, in fact, the, even the new runes have a derived rune that I use all the time for doing the same thing. Okay, here's a good one. Uh, along the lines of tree splitting, explain the concept of code splitting in modern JavaScript applications. How does it work? What are the performance implications? Additionally, describe how code splitting interacts with lazy loading. Ah, oh, that's good. Um, so code splitting is the it takes your application and it will chop it up into different bundles so that only the code that is needed on a specific page will be run. So you might have an entire application, but uh, your shopping cart code is not loaded on the home page because it's not needed that that chunk is not needed until you actually open up the the shopping cart so it's kind of similar to tree shaking in that you're just trying to figure out what is needed where but tree shaking is getting rid of code that is never used in your application before it's even bundled and code splitting is loading the code that is needed but intelligently when it is needed and in chunks, the chunks is like and a big chunks. part of it. Like, yeah, whenever you see like you'll go into and you're like if you're using Vite or something, you go into your um, compiled folder or whatever, you'll see a bunch of chunk.js files that have like an ID on them or something. Those are all them Chunky. chunks. Yeah. Awesome. Did I did I nail it? Did would you say? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> All right. The question here is describe these advanced techniques for maintaining accessible focus order in web accessibility. One, the use of ARIA live regions around announce, announcing dynamic content changes. Two, a skip to main content link. Three, a ta uh, proper uses of tab index. And four, handling modal dialogues and their impact on focus trapping. This is good because we just recorded an episode where you called out uh, several of these. Ooh, and he's got a smoothie. Ooh. <laughs> from oh, Talinsky's Talinsky Tavern. Ta Where's that? What's that from? Um, oh, um, I can't get it to focus. My grandpa, who has passed, had these glasses in his bar. And I don't know where he got them because he got them a while ago. And so for one Christmas, my parents duped him somehow and then... I oh, think that's so great. probably I don't know if it's generic or whatever. It could just be generic. Either way, my grandpa had these in his bar. So when he passed, my parents got my brother <laughs> and I a set of them just for our own household. Uh, oh, not not great. quite drinking a beer out of it. This is like it a, almost kind looks of... like you're having a, a thing of relish. Mm hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I have no idea what's in here. I couldn't tell you. Um, but hey, uh, love a good smoothie and smoothie on delivery. Hey, OK, so <laughs> let's get through each of these. The use of ARIA live regions and announcing dynamic content changes. I don't know about the announcing dynamic content changes part, but uh, ARIA live regions are used for uh, stuff that is being updated. You could think of like when you deploy to your Vercel, you get the logs that are streaming in there to a window that could mm -hmm. be used, I believe, for a live region. A chat window is it's one of the most common use cases for this. It's like indicating an area that will be updating live. Yep. Implementing a skip to content link. So this is useful when you know a lot of sites have a lot of links in their navigation, even mm -hmm. just a couple of links in your navigation. You got your header, like three or four links. And sometimes if you're using your site with a keyboard or with um, with the audio navigation or anything like that, it's going to announce all that stuff. And if you want to just get to the main section of the content, something that our us abled people are easy to just scroll down and see, right? You have to yeah. hit tab a hundred times. So what times people do is they put a skip to main content button that is 
visually hidden initially until it's focused and then it will show up and then allow you to hit enter on that button and it will zoom you down to the main content. So that way you don't have to hit <laughs> tab a hundred times just to get to that main content area and it will focus on, on the main content. So that way, again, the keyboard navigation gets to be way easier. Proper usage of tab index. Tab index defines where that tab order goes. The tab index by default in the browser is usually pretty decent, depending on what you need it to do. And by decent, I mean decent. Sometimes though, you have visually things and maybe even in the DOM, things that are in a different position than you might be expecting. And if you hit tab, it might go over here when you want it to go here first. So if you want the tab order to go here, then here, then here, then here, then here, then here, whatever, you can manually set a tab index and it's escalating numbers uh, like zero, one, two, three, four. Uh, I think that's correct. And that's the thing I ended up using that much, to be honest, but it, it could be, it could be definitely necessary. I think I did use it on the level up site. Uh, handling modal dialogues and their impact on focus trapping. Hey, we just kind of talked about this in an episode we did on new CSS stuff. I would use the dialogue element because when you open it, it automatically traps your focus and applies inert to the document. So that way you're focused directly automatically when that dialogue opens into the inputs and into the dialogue. And likewise, popover will uh, get you focused into there right away as well. So pop over dialogue and then not have to worry about it with uh, implementing JavaScript and all that jazz. That was a master class. Thank you. Accessibility tips. That was good. I was a little um, nervous when I got the question, so I'm glad yeah, I, I hit each of them. It was a big question. I was like, ah, but that's full of, full of good nuggets. I like it. Let me tell you, Wes, when I was on stage at JS Nation, you know, there's like a thousand people in the audience. It was crazy, yeah. right? No, um, more than that. I think it's 1,500. Well, there Huge. was 16, 1,600 in attendance at the one that I went to uh, <laughs> that I was speaking at. And it was yeah. ridiculous, the, the crowd. It was amazing. But when the questions came streaming in, I kid you not, I was expecting the questions to be like, what's the difference between popover and dialogue? And I like prepared answers for all the questions. And then the yeah. questions proceeded to be like a nonstop assault of accessibility questions that I couldn't answer well. Oh, I was just like, yeah. I was I was mortified because it would all be always be stuff that I I just was like, I, I just hadn't even considered or whatever. And that's the thing about accessibility. It's like, there's always things you're not considering and there's always more to learn. I, I feel like I'm, I'm pretty well tuned up on this stuff and still it was like, yeah. oh, I don't know about that. I'll have to look into that. <laughs> Uh, I, when I was at that same conference, 1500 people in, I, um, was tethering my phone cause I was upstairs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did I tell the story? And no, I, somebody at the conference told me about it. They were like, Oh, oh I saw gosh. Wes last like, year and he had a disaster where his internet I wasn't throws. working. So I was using a, my slide deck was using a node module to do, um, color highlighting mm -hmm. and I did it all local because I was like, it can't trust the internet, you know? And then I, I was tethering my phone and it was working. And then I, I went up on stage, I opened my slides, refreshed the page and boom, white. And I was like, <laughs> Oh shoot. And there's, there's 1500 people. I'm the last one oh, no. to, to do the whole day. No. And nothing, nothing was loading. Like I couldn't even show my slides. So I open up dev tools in front of 1500 people and I saw that there was like the syntax highlighter was requesting um, grammars from an external service oh, and it was downloading wow. it. And because I was not on the internet, that was breaking and the whole thing mm -hmm. croaked. But I like, I froze because there's 1500 people and I was just like, yeah, ah. yeah, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and then people started yelling, you're just not on the internet. You're not on the internet. And I was just like, ugh. And then like somebody somebody was beside me. I don't even remember who it was. I was like, can you just get me on the internet? And he's like, yeah, yeah, no problem. And then everything was fine. But I was like, whew, should have thought of that one before if, if, uh, I got on stage. If you all want to see what that amount of people looks like in an audience, I have a photo that I'll have in the show notes that uh, we can include in the show notes for you. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a lot so of people. It's so much that they have a screen halfway down the audience to, yeah. because you can't see from the back of the room. 
I know when you're looking at this picture and you see the screen hanging down, just know that that's the halfway point. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's so intimidating. For me, Wes, I didn't have any uh, network issues, but I had prepared like notes for all of my slides. And then I realized that because I did all of my demos in iframes, if I wanted to actually click the demos and interact with them on my computer, I I would have had to like look at the big screen to do it. Oh. So I had to mirror my screen and I did my ah. whole talk without notes, which, you know, <laughs> I prepped. I, I did a lot of studying for it. But like, yeah. yeah, it was just like last minute. Oh, wait, you can't use your notes. Ooh, OK. Oh, man. <laughs> That's great. I've never done notes on a talk before. I, was just, I don't really like it either. Yeah. Just riff on it. Well, it's, we do this podcast three times a week. We're pretty good at riffing on it, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll put a little right. suggestions uh, for me, but yeah, that's it. Let's do one more question for me and then we'll, or we'll move into some sick picks. Oh, well, th that was the end of round six. So was it? I, since, yeah. So if you want. You, oh, okay. Should we do one? Yeah. Let's do one more round. One more round each. Okay. Yeah. Okay, this is a good one for you. I think you'll like this one. Explain the concept of server sent events, SSE, in web development, and tell us uh, how are, how do they differ from web sockets? Um, this rest is implementation stuff. What are the advantages and limitations? Let's just do that. Server site, server sent events. What are they? How do they differ yes. from web sockets? And what are their limitations and advantages? Uh, all right, server sent events are a streaming connection to the server so it's it's a request that you make from the client to the server however that request stays open for a certain amount of time i forget what it is i think it's like two minutes or something maybe a little longer than that that might be wrong but that allows the server to send events from the server to the client similar to how a WebSocket would be opening opened up and you're sending data. The difference between server sent events and a WebSocket is WebSockets allow you to do bidirectional data, um, meaning that you can send data from the client to the server and uh, from, from the server to the client. So a server sent event would be, is good for when you are doing things like processing. Um, you know, you, you upload a, a video and you get data back from the server as to how is that processing being done. Or or I am generating something with AI and it takes 20 seconds, but I know how far I am. You can mm. use server sent events to send that data. Whereas like a web sockets would be good for like a chat where you're you're sending data back and forth um, in real time. Hell yeah. Is that right? Perfect. Beautiful. All right, last question of the day. Okay, I have one about the difference between layout and paint. Oh. But I feel like that is one of those that I we've answered it on this podcast, but I couldn't, I don't know that I could tell you. We already answered it in this episode. Of, oh, you're right. <laughs> I I don't know if that was the, the actual question, though. It was part of it, yeah. What it was? What's the difference between contain layout and contain paint? And oh. How can they be optimizing rendering performance? Yeah, all oh. right, there we go. That's the question. So it's the CSS contain property. <sighs> this is not one I necessarily use because again, it's it's like a use it if you need it if you need that speed in your your painting your rendering. Um, I, I would un I would maybe guess that contain layout or contain paint is for when you know that either the positional stuff is not changing or you know that the painting, like color, fonts, that sort of stuff is not changing. So you'd say contain paint. And this is like just totally guessing. Or mm, I don't know what it is. I'm going to be straight up. I never use these. The contain CSS property allows the author to indicate that an element and its contents are as much as possible independent from the rest of the document tree. This allows mm. the browser to recalculate the layout style, paint size, or any combination of them for a limited area of the DOM and not the entire page, leading to obvious performance benefits. That's from MDN. Yeah. Um, and like, again... I don't dip into that all that often. I think if you're into really or, or ever, uh, really, you know, like, but if you're doing like really heavy animation and you really need the performance, generally the browser tries to figure out what needs to be updated on the page. But this is a way for you to explicitly tell the browser some details about your page and that will lead to better performance. 
Yeah, this is stuff I need to get into a little bit more. What's what's interesting to me, it's like, I think, I know this is not like a the same use case, but like yeah. when I think getting into really heavy performance stuff, at some point you're just like, all right, use use Canvas and, and call it a day because that's where you're going to get the best performance. But if it's like part of your app UI, then that's a different situation still. All right, uh, let's move into some sick picks. What do you have today for a sick pick? Mm. All right, I got one if you don't. Yeah, you can go. All right, I got a sick pick something today uh, called Tire Slime. And Tire Slime is something that you should go buy a bottle of right now and throw it in the back of your car because it's going to be super handy. So this is some green goop that you can squeeze into a tire that has a slow leak or or possibly even a, a fast leak. And it works amazingly wow. well. So if you have a bike tire, this. I've used it on my ATV. I've used it on our a tractor. I bought a new trailer at the cottage, a little dump trailer, and it came with some rotted out tires and I couldn't find the correct t- replacement tire. So you know what I did? You you basically, you take the um, Schroeder valve off and then you have what's called a, um, a valve stem core removal tool. It's in the mm-hmm. lid of the bottle. You take that out and then it's basically a hole. F- squeeze it full of slime and then put it back in and then spin the tire around or just move it around a couple times. And what it does is when you pump it up, it forces this sort of adhesive into any of the holes and seals them right up. And it's saved my bacon so many times, especially like I have so many clapped, clapped out crappy little things at the cottage where they're all have like continual leaks and you have to pump it up every time you use it and it's good for two weeks. Don't do that. Pump it full of slime. You're good to go. Stuff is awesome, especially if you, you run over a nail or something like that and you, you have to get home. Tire yeah, slime that's is, what I was is, thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Can it, you just it, squeeze it, it into the, the like where that like can you squeeze it externally onto a hole as well? Or do you have to do the no, internal? Because the way that it works is via air pressure and it squeezes itself out of mm. it. So you have to you got to squeeze it into the tire, roll the tire around a couple times and it, it sort of coats the inside of the tire. And then yeah. as soon as you pump it up, it forces the slime through any external gotcha. cracks. That's how it the t- works. Tire okay. people hate it because th- then they have a mess of goop to clean up <laughs> when they fix your tire. But what is this goop? Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, I can see those tire tire folks. Yeah. Not loving that. You can do it preemptively as well. Meaning that if you have like a bike tire or something like that, you can you put it in your tires and then if you run over something, the slime just immediately comes out. There's videos online where somebody sticks a staple into a tire and you can see it just go <laughs> and it seals itself. That's sick. Oh man. Yeah. I did not know this existed. Um, yeah. That's Grab a I bottle for your emergency yeah. kit. I know. I just bought on prime day, one of those uh, battery powered jumpers. Oh, and then I have one of the so battery good. powered inflators. It's like I'm, I'm my my emergency kit's ready to go. I'm, yeah. I'm gonna stick pick a, a website here, and it's a really simple website. It shows you the power of like kind of it's like on even like old school web type type of website, and it's called discprices.com. And basically, if you're needing an X your hard drive or uh, even like a NVMe or any kind of drive, disk drive internal or okay. external. There's a big old list of options. You can tell it what you want and what it will tell you, it'll order them by the price per terabyte or price per gigabyte of this drive or price per terabyte, right? So that way you can see relatively like this drive might be eight terabytes, but it's priced cheaper price per terabyte than this one that's four terabytes. So it also checks pri- uh, like prices really well. So you can uh, check any given point to see like, you know, what, what the current drive prices are at. I need some more drives for my Synology. And so I've been keeping an eye on this to see if there's any deals for me. Ooh, would it kill them? This is like the most primitive website ever. Would it's it so kill primitive. them? To to tiger stripe these rows of data, <laughs> so you can yes, like that's the one look, thing. Yeah, you look at the price, and then you have to like mouse over to the link. You Come can on. just double click on. No, you can't. Um, yeah, Firefox has has the ability to select a table row, but Does it's not it? on Firefox anymore. No, mm. I guess that's a, a easy user script. This is a cool website. Wow, it's massive. Yeah, eleven dollars so. per terabyte. Freaking Apple. 
putting <laughs> like 256 gigs in a laptop, which is criminal. They should not be I doing know. that. Friggin and crazy. then I finally caved on my phone. I finally caved and bought the like Apple, like what's it called? Like you get like if you run out of space on your phone. Oh, yeah. The uh, cloud iCloud cloud iCloud. And then like for like two months, they stopped bothering me about it. And then it ran out of the 200 gigs. Oh, and now oh. they're trying to get me to upgrade They're Like, leave me alone. I know. I record so much video of my dance practice that I like fill it up in no time. And then I'm going to oh, leave yeah. it. And it's like, yeah, it's a hassle. I don't want to I don't want to buy pay any more <laughs> than what I'm paying. My right wife now. is the worst at that. Her phone is always full and she deletes mm. all her apps because there's no room so she just deletes apps and then every time i tell her you have to get a new app to like pay for charging for the car she's like i there's no room for apps and then i like go on her phone and her like gmail or has like 800 gigs i'm just gonna buy her like an 11 terabyte phone <laughs> never have to worry about it i always do buy the largest capacity phone even though so uh, so, it's so expensive it's yeah. just yeah i i I work with too much media to have um, low, low gigabytes on anything, honestly, just because yeah. video files take up so much and so much of my life is video files. So, yeah. yeah. But why can you buy? I know that like I'm not Mr. Android or whatever, but like why can you buy a little like one terabyte SSD card or a little micro SD card for like how much is a one terabyte micro SD card? Yeah, Let's I know. Look this up. Well, I, you, you, yeah, I know. That would be kind of hundred and twenty nine dollars Canadian. Like, why cannot we just just give us a bit of extra? I know. I realize it's a little slower than your than the SS the stuff that's wired right into the iPhone. But like, give me a better option, please. I agree. Yeah, I know how hard. I know they don't. Why they don't want to? They want it's you to buy cloud the iCloud. Services. Yeah, but yeah. just give, give, yeah, give me a little port in there and I'll plug it in. You can cover it. You can make it waterproof. We all know you can make it waterproof. So yeah. that's not a good excuse. Yeah, I know they just don't like people having that type of control yeah. over their device, Android which, users yeah. shaking right now. <laughs> 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 I know. I was. I was one for a long time, and uh, I'm going to keep keep my things to myself about. I do love Android, so. All right. Well, that's it. Shameless plugs. Check out Syntax on YouTube uh, at Syntax FM on YouTube. We do so much great stuff. You can get every episode that we're releasing over on YouTube. And a lot of them we're doing video showing code. You want to see code? We show code. We show code all day long. And there's a lot of great Love tutorials. Code. CJ does a lot of deep dives and all kinds of stuff. So if you're interested in more video content, more high-end syntax stuff check us out on youtube all right catch you later peace